my own notes, but uh, the original thoughts from this, the inspiration for it, came from Brother uh, T.R. McNeely. He's a, a preacher from Texas. Probably a lot of you don't know him. I haven't heard from him in quite a long time, but he used to preach a lot. Uh, he pastored in Texas, and um, he preached in California. And I heard him a few times out there. Absolutely wonderful preacher. But uh, these notes came out of his own uh, church Bible study. And uh, myself and Brother Garrett got a hold of them many years ago. I've taught this series in, in my uh, church once before. But it's been years since I've done it. I've been feeling a burden to uh, bring it back to my church again. So when we started the college back up, uh, I uh, offered to bring this here, and it was accepted. So uh, this is called Spirits That Destroy, a study of Satan's devices used to divide and destroy God's church. Uh, and the church is made up of individuals, so if Satan can mess up an individual, then he has messed up the church. Uh, if you have your Bibles, if you'd open them tonight, let's go in the, in the Word to Galatians, the fifth chapter. And uh, a lot of these spirits are just uh, augmented uh, works of the flesh, which is what Galatians is about. Uh, the works of the flesh, and then Satan gets in and, and, and enhances uh, these works of the flesh by evil spirits. And uh, so turn to Galatians chapter 5. Five. Okay, and beginning with verse 19 through 21. Okay, now the works of the flesh are manifest, which are these, adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, uh, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envians, uh, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Of the which I tell you, which I tell you before, as I also told you in time past, that they which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. And then he goes on to say, but the fruit of the Spirit is, thank God there's a positive side to this, love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance, against such there is no law. Amen. And so what I have done, I, I made a list after we, after we started getting into this. And during this past week, I made a list of 21 different spirits that Satan likes to use. And then knowing that we only have uh, a certain amount of time, we, we have 12 sessions. Lord willing, we don't get interruptions here. Uh, we have 12 sessions to end this uh, semester. And so I have uh, taken those, those 21 things that I uh, thought of. And, and bunched some of them together and came out with nine uh, of these uh, spirits that I feel are predominant, that, that we need to study and we need to understand, and uh, that coincides with the number nine of the gifts of the Spirit. And uh, hopefully we'll have enough gifts of the Spirit to get rid of the evil spirits Amen. that would try to uh, harass and, uh, and, and disorient the people of God. And again, I say, we deal with these spirits on an individual basis. But if we don't, if we don't deal with the spirits that come to, uh, to influence us, if that spirit starts uh, manipulating us and controlling our lives, then we end up causing that spirit to come into the church. And there is nothing more heartening than to see a good church divided and, and uh, uh, slowed down because of spirits that are manifest in the church that should not be there. Right. So that's why we want to study this. We want to be on guard against Satan's devices. The Bible says that we should be wise concerning Satan's devices. Don't be ignorant of his uh, devices. 
Amen. And then also, in the book of Revelation, if you'll turn there to chapter 21, right at the close of the Bible, the close of the book of Revelation, the tribulation period has already been passed through, and uh, now it's talking about the wrap-up, how that uh, those that, that are lost are going to be cast into the lake of fire. And it gives a list here, and it will be uh, much uh, the same as some of these other things that were listed by the Apostle Paul in Galatian. This is John writing in the book of Revelation, and uh, uh, it says here, I want to read verse 7, He that overcometh shall inherit all things. And that's what we want to do is overcome yeah. over every spirit that's not of God. And I will be his God, and he shall be my son. Amen. Sounds good, doesn't it? Yes. Praise the Lord. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers and whoremongers and sorcerers and idolaters and all liars shall have their part in the lake which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Amen. All right. So if you don't if you don't go up in the first resurrection, you're going to end up in the second death. So uh, we don't we don't want to let some spirit of the devil get into our heart and mind and cause us to lose out with God. Amen. And so uh, I don't think I brought in here that complete list of all those, but we're going to start with the spirit of rebellion. Let me read this uh, this introductory part here. And I misspelled introduction on this note, so you need to have C in there. It's I-N-T-R-O-D-U-C-T. Oh, okay. What is, what is it? Introduction is spelled wrong. It's spelled introduction. Oh, okay. Well, that's not your typo. Did you get a note, Sister Karen? Did you get a note? Yes. Okay. Yeah, All right. The introduction. In this study, we will look at the spirits that Satan uses to hinder the work of God. I'm reading on the introduction now. All right. These spirits are evil and have the potential to do great harm to the, the spiritual walk of the believer. Where do these spirits come from? And listen carefully to this. The potential to do evil is always present in the human heart. Would somebody read for me uh, Jeremiah 17 and verse 9? This is sword drill. <laughs> go, Janelle, go. The heart is deceitful above all things. <laughs> <laughs> the heart is deceitful above, above all things and desperately wicked if you can know it. All right. The heart is deceitful above all things. It's talking about your heart, my heart. Okay? And uh, we, we, we've got pretty good hearts by comparison with a lot of things we see out there in the world. But don't ever forget it. That your heart is capable of deception. Your heart can deceive you, and your heart can be deceived. So that the, the, the heart of mankind, because we have an inherently sinful nature that was passed to us by Adam, we have a heart that is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. If we don't stay prayed through, if we don't walk with God, there is no telling what can come out of our hearts. I've heard people say before, you know, somebody in the church looking at somebody doing something grossly evil, and they would say, I would never do something like that. Even if I was a servant of God, I would never do something like that. But you don't know what you would do if you weren't serving God. You don't know because the heart will deceive you. And that's why the Bible says in one place, God is greater than our hearts. And so we've got to let the Holy Ghost rule and reign in our hearts. Amen. So the potential to do evil is always present in the human spirit, uh, in the human heart. Jeremiah 17, 9. But there is further influence exerted by evil spirits sent forth by Satan's command. Unlike God's angels who are ministering spirits, they're, they're here to help. And thank God two-thirds of the angels are, are, are our helpers. 
our, our ministers. Uh, I, I want someone to read uh, Hebrews 1, 13 to 14. But the words of the angels say, Yet any time it is not my right hand, until I make thy name with thy footstool. Are they not all ministering spirits? Sit forth to minister for them who shall be heirs, heirs and of salvation. All right. This is talking about the angels. Are they not all ministering spirits that are sent sent forth? Read that wording to me again. Uh, uh, sent forth um, to minister. To minister for them who shall be heirs of salvation. People like us, to those who shall be the heirs of salvation, the angels are sent forth to minister to us. Amen. And that's that's God's angels, those that are following Him, that are commissioned by Him. But you remember, when Satan fell, he drew one-third of the angels with him. And so we know that there are angels who are just as powerful and strong and, and uh, just as uh, capable as those good angels that are, they are evil spirits. We sometimes call them imps. There are spirits in the world, devils loose in this world, that what they do is they take your human nature, which you, you have, even though you have the Holy Ghost, you've still got a deceitful heart and a human nature that is prone toward the works of the flesh. And then these evil spirits. You see, Satan himself is not omnipresent. He's not God. In fact, he's a long stretch from God. Amen. Amen. Yeah, uh, but he can only be where he is. But he's got devils working with him, right. uh, spirits working with him. Yeah. And these spirits will, will come into the weakness of a man's flesh and a woman's flesh. And those things that uh, you're tempted by and, and work on you and influence you toward those evil things. And so it starts with our nature, with the works of the flesh, as Paul said in Galatians. But it is enhanced then by evil spirits, spirits that destroy, that want to destroy us as individuals and want to uh, take, uh, interrupt and, and, uh, and mess up the flow of the church, evil spirits. So unlike God's angels who are ministering spirits, these fallen angels are sent forth to hinder. We must be aware of Satan's devices. I just remembered a story that my dad loved to tell. and um, uh, yeah, I think it's fitting right now. He, he used to tell a story about the, the, the imp of discouragement. He said that this... Uh, uh, one fellow was walking along the street, you know, and he was just feeling fine and, and uh, enjoying himself. And, and uh, But this little imp, if you could visualize it like a little monkey, climbs up <laughs> on his shoulder, you know, and start talking to him. And he says to him, and this is the imp of discouragement, he says, you know, you're discouraged. And this guy says, no, I'm, I'm not discouraged. And he said, oh, yes, you're discouraged. And he said, well, I, I, I don't think I'm discouraged. Oh, yes, you're discouraged. You know, the, the, the more you hesitate, the more strongly this spirit comes on. Oh, yes, you're discouraged. And he said, well, I, I guess I am a little discouraged. And, and before long, you know, this, this guy has lost his whistle and, and the spring in his step. And he's just slouching along, his head bowed down. And he's discouraged simply by the influence of an evil spirit. Anybody know what I'm talking right. about? Yes. Start off on a pretty good day and just somehow there's just a, a battle going on that wears you down. Yes. And But there is this other fellow that, uh, that Satan, when, when this little imp came back, uh, you know, down to, down to hell and Satan said, how'd you do? He said, well, it worked really good. I, I got him, you know, and took away his victory. And he said, well, there goes another guy. Go get him, you know. So this guy's walking along and so this little imp of discouragement, you know, he gets up on his shoulders and he says to this guy, this guy's going along and he's doing great, you know, and, and he says, you're discouraged. And he said, no, I'm not discouraged. And, oh, yes, you're, you're discouraged. He said, I'm not discouraged. And this little man says, oh, yes, you're, you're discouraged. He said, devil, you're a liar. I'm not discouraged. Yeah. And that oh, little oh. imp bowed his head and climbed down on of him, tucked his tail, and went back down to hell. Amen. And he was discouraged. Amen. <laughs> Praise God. You, you, you got to know how to deal with those spirits that, yes. that come after you. Amen. And use the Word of God on them. Well, hallelujah. I'm getting hot. Come on. Come on. Come on. I don't know if uh, it's hot in here or not, but... 
Uh, if, it, if it does get too warm, let me know and we'll open that door back up. All right, let's stand together. We need to pray before we get into this first uh, subject here. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord. Jesus. 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 Spirits that destroy, and the first spirit that we are going to uh, discuss is the spirit of rebellion. Probably one of the most prominent uh, spirits that has been used over and over again as a destructive uh, force used against the church of the living God. Amen. So we want to be wise to this spirit that uh, is so, so many times used against individuals and against the church. Praise God. The spirit of rebellion. Uh, notice in your notes that rebellion also includes, and I think this is included in your notes, rebellion uh, also includes pride. And this is where we're kind of lumping things together. You could take each one of these individually and do a whole lesson on them. But I'm gonna, for the sake of us only having 12 shots together here, I'm going to uh, group these together. Rebellion includes pride. Uh, it includes stubbornness. Uh, I was just talking to somebody just in the last day or so, and they were talking about a particular person, and they said they're just so stubborn, just so unyielding, just will not change from, from the direction that they're going, so stubborn in that way. And, uh, and, and the Bible says that stubbornness is as idolatry. I mean, it, it's, it's a sinful thing. And stubbornness is, is um, uh, included in rebellion, along with pride. And along with arrogance, our ego, and self-centeredness, uh, some people cannot see past themselves, and everything's got to go their way. And uh, uh, that is a spirit that comes from the devil. You know what uh, uh, Satan got cast out of heaven for? It, it was just pride and rebellion, these very things that we're going to talk about tonight. This, this beautiful creature, one of the highest creatures that God ever made, uh, made beautiful, made full of music. Uh, somebody's calling the choir director of heaven, had great influence over the others. He, 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 was, he was beautiful. Uh, the descriptions are given of him in Ezekiel uh, 38 or Ezekiel 28 and Isaiah 14. Uh, two passages that tell about the fall of Satan. The, I mean, he was some magnificent creature called the anointed cherub. Uh, he had it all. He was next to God. He was close to God. He was at the head of the angels. He lived in heaven. And yet because he, he became dissatisfied with his place and wanted to take the, the glory that goes to God, he led a rebellion against God. And because of that, this beautiful anointed angel became the devil that we know because of rebellion. Pride and rebellion and arrogance and self-centeredness. And then there is a man that, uh, that has demonstrated in the Word of God uh, the, the spirit of rebellion in a way probably greater than anyone else. And that is the first king of Israel by the name of Saul. And we're going to read the scripture that was actually written for him and spoken to him by the prophet Samuel. Let's all turn in our Bibles to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 15 and verse 23. This is uh, Saul. 
and we'll talk about him perhaps more later, but Saul started out so good. I've, I've taught another series in my church, and I hope to bring that to the college, uh, maybe even next, uh, next semester when we start in the fall. But uh, the saga of the kings, and uh, it, it's, it, you just learn so much from the, uh, the characteristics of these kings that God put over his people. I mean, you can just see such a, a wide array of uh, the, the natures and the ways of, of, uh, of these kings. But Saul started out so beautiful. He was God's pick. You know, Samuel was very disappointed that they, they, they decided to have a king. But God said, you go, go ahead and go along with it. I know you're, you're personally hurt by it. And he said, they're, they're not, they're not as, it's not as much hurt against you as it is against me. Because I want to rule over them. But they want a king, so we're going to give them a king. So if they're going to have a king, God's going to choose. And God chose a young man. He was very tall. He was head and shoulders above all the other men of Israel. So he, he was like a natural born leader. Uh, and uh, uh, he, he, he was intelligent. He was from good stock. Uh, he, he was, uh, you know, the tribe of Benjamin. Uh, he was an Israelite, which was a requirement that the king had to be from among the brethren. Couldn't be an outsider. Uh, he fit all the qualifications. And when he first was brought in as king, he was, uh, he, he was so humble that when they got ready to crown him king to have a coronation ceremony, he hid himself among the stuff, the Bible says. But it didn't take long for that to change. And there are some people that are that way. All it takes is a little glory, a little honor, and their spirit changes and goes from that, that spirit of humility suddenly to them lording over other people, becoming disobedient, becoming proud and arrogant, and rebelling against God. You know, God wants to bless us all, but He's more concerned that we be saved. If God sees that He cannot elevate you without you turning into a wrong attitude and a wrong spirit, it's much better that He keeps you humbled. It's much better that you be saved. Jesus said in the New Testament, Matthew chapter 10, talking about it, it's a totally different subject, but it, 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 it'd be better for you to pluck out your own eye and enter into heaven with only one eye, which be pretty hard since you're going to have a glorified body. But uh, <laughs> if you had to enter into heaven with one eye, that'd be better than having two eyes and going to hell right. or cutting your hand off. And by the way, he wasn't encouraging us to do that. There's not an example anywhere in the Bible of anybody doing that. So he, he wasn't telling you to go out and cut your hand off because you did something wrong. But he's telling you, remember, it's better. It would be better for you to go through life crippled and maimed and go to heaven and be right with God Amen. than for you to have a whole healthy body and end up lost in a devil's hell. Amen. So, uh, and so it is here. If, if, if you cannot be elevated without it creating wrong things in you, then I, I know people that, you know, they have job opportunities. Somebody wants to make a manager. They say, that's okay. I'm happy right where I'm at. Because they, they feel like that's not a good place for them to be. And, uh, you know, they don't do well when they're put over other groups of people. And so God wants to elevate us, but only if we grow in Him and can handle that. And so it was with the kings. that God lifted up this young man who was very humble, but then he became very proud. And listen to what the prophet said to him in uh, this verse of Scripture. What was it? 15... 23. Okay. 1523. All right. Let's, let's take in 22. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight. And you know the context of this story. This is when the Lord sent Saul down to destroy the Amalekites. He said, Destroy everything. Bring nothing back. Destroy every breathing thing, even the animals. But here they came back with sheep, ox, and all that. Plus the king of the Amalekites, Saul spared him. I guess he was a cool guy or something. And, and, and Saul's bringing him back. And Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying 
the voice of the Lord. See, they, they were putting out that they were bringing these animals back. They're going to offer them up to God as a sacrifice. And the, the prophet said, as the Lord has great a delight in sacrifices, or is it better to obey the word of the Lord? I mean, you're going to bold face, go against the will of God, and then try to offer what you've disobeyed to the Lord. He's not going to receive that. Right. He's not going to receive a sacrifice that was against his will. Amen. Uh, obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to hearken than the fat of rams. God would rather see your obedience than swell, smell the savor of your sacrifice. Amen. He wants to know if you're obeying His word. And then this is the key verse here. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft. And that's pretty bad. Right. Yeah. In fact, in the days of Saul... Saul killed all of the witches in the land. He destroyed witchcraft from the land. And one managed to escape him. And Saul himself ended up, because of his rebellion, ended up at the witch's house trying to get direction because he could not hear from the Lord. And the next day died after that. His last communication was with a witch. And then he died on the battlefield. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness as iniquity and idolatry. And there's, there's that stubbornness. And that's mixed in with rebellion. A person just being downright stubborn. You just can't reason with them. You can't change them. You can't turn them from the path that they're on. They're obstinate. And that all fits in with a rebellious attitude. And it's like iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. Now, this happened within the first few years of Saul's reign. And Saul reigned for 40 years. Amen. Probably within the first two or three years. Within probably at least the first five years. I don't know the exact time here. But this was early on in the reign of Saul. And you know what happened to him after this time. God rejected him, stopped Samuel from praying for him. And God sent an evil spirit to torment this young king. He became so demented, so tormented, so oppressed of evil spirits that he became full of jealousy over David because of the little song that they sang. And instead of ruling and reigning over the, the, the people of God, he spent his, his whole kingship chasing David around the countryside. <laughs> Out in the wilderness and down in the land of the Philistines and down into Moab. He's out there with his army chasing the next king. Trying to destroy him like Herod the Great destroyed all those babies in Bethlehem. Because he said, nobody's going to be king but me. You know, and, and Saul had that same spirit. I'm going to destroy this young man. I can feel that the anointing is upon him. I can tell he's chosen of the Lord. So I'm going to wipe him out. And so instead of ruling over the people of God and being blessed as he could have been, and God told him, and Samuel gave him these words, that God would have made you like David. I mean, he didn't use that, he didn't use David's name, but he said God would have made your children to become the continual heirs of the throne. It would have been the seed of Saul instead of the seed of David that ruled upon the throne over Israel. But because of his rebellion, because an humble man became proud and rebelled against God, two major sins that Saul committed. The first of them was to enter into the high priest's office and, and only the high priest could offer the sacrifices. And he was waiting on Samuel to come. Samuel was a priest and a prophet. And, and Samuel was the one who offered the sacrifices. But Samuel was taking his time he was on his own schedule, as preachers sometimes are. And Saul was impatient. He's fixing to go to battle, and he wants his sacrifice done. So Saul said, forget him. I'll just offer the sacrifice. I'm king. He may have been king, but he was no priest. That's right. He did not belong in the place of sacrifice. And so he had just finished offering up the sacrifice when the true priest came walking up. And that was the beginning of a disobedience. I believe that if Saul would have had a true repentance, even though that was a grievous sin, friend, when you step beyond your bounds, okay, and you, you, you begin to take a place 
Let me just bring this down to the local church. When you begin to step into a place that you don't belong in, that the authority of that church has not put you in, and you try to assume authority, that is a very dangerous thing. You need to grow naturally. You need to grow under leadership and let them lift you up. And they will do that. If you're in the will of God, you will be lifted up. But you step out of your place and say, they're taking too long. They don't recognize my ability. They don't rec- recognize who I am. And you get out of your place, you're going to mess everything up from the, from the church all the way to the, in the sight of God. So you've got you've to let God work things out. Brother uh, Von Morton preached a message that's very famous called, Let God Unfold the Rose. Let God unfold the rose. You know, sometimes you can be impatient about a rose if you buy a rose as, as, as a bud. You know, it, it takes time for that rose to unfold. And it just it likes to stay closed up for a while. That's natural for it. And then slowly it will begin to open up little by little. It begins to open up into a very beautiful thing, you know. And, but if you try to open it up before then, what happens? You, you, you tear it up. It, it breaks apart. You cannot... Make a rose unfold. It's got to do it in its own time. And so it is with with our lives. You, you've got to grow up under leadership, under authority, be in subjection, have an humble spirit. And the Bible says that, that God will exalt the humble, uh, those, those who humble themselves and keep in their proper place. Can I hear an amen? amen. amen. I know it's the truth. Yes. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Well, praise God. Amen. And so then the second thing that Saul did was when he was sent to the Amalekites and he came home in direct disobedience. And not only that, but there was not any... Paul, uh, Saul, excuse me, Saul did speak the words, I have sinned. Yes. But listen to how he did it. In the same sentence with that. He said, I have sinned. Come with me and let's go worship the Lord. Now that's not what I call repentance. I have sinned. Come with me. Let's fake it. Let's act like nothing's wrong and let's go worship the Lord so the people won't know the difference. And that's a sorry preacher there. Amen. When he wants to deceive, he, he does not want to acknowledge that he stepped out of his place. Amen. And so, uh, when, when he did that, this was the second great sin that he did against the Lord. And the Lord said, I'm, I'm through with him. And immediately told Samuel, he said, I want you to... Samuel spent the night in prayer weeping over Saul. He, he loved him so much. You, you can imagine this. It was his hands that were laid upon Saul. It was his horn of oil that poured upon his head. He, he had probably to reach way up to get that oil poured on his head and let it run down over him. And, and, and he loved him. And, uh, you know, this was the first king. And this was, you know, in the right way, this was his pride, this, this, this young man. And he, he loved him. And, and his reputation was bound up in the success of this young man because he had anointed him. He spent the night in prayer. And God came to him and said, get up off your knees and don't pray for him anymore. It would be a horrible thing to know that God was telling somebody to stop praying for you. Yeah. Wouldn't it? Yes. But rebellion will do that. People can reach a certain place where God says, I'm, I'm not interested in hearing you pray about this individual. I'm, I'm done. I'm through. And we're not always the judge of that. Only God is the, the judge of that. But uh, that's what happened in the case of Saul. And, and while Saul was still king and going to be king for many, many years, God sent Samuel to go anoint David, who was still just a young, very young man, called a lad of a boy, although he was not a child, like you see in the Sunday school pictures. He's not a child. Uh, he, was, he was a young, a ruddy young man. Amen. So, that was the, the terrible sin of rebellion. So, uh, let me just give you a little information here. The definition of rebellion is to resist authority and the laws that are written to resist authority to resist the law to revolt to be in defiance to oppose to resist control rebellion is a re- is a revolt against one's rightful lord or master it is 
uh, insubordination, uh, not willing to be submitted. A rebellion is taking yourself out of the hands of God, saying, I will run my own life. I will rule myself. I will decide what's right and wrong for me. Rebellion is, uh, recognizes no power superior to itself, to that person's self. They recognize no power greater than them. Rebellion is deliberate. Rebellion doesn't happen to people innocently. You, you can't be innocently rebellious. It's too strong of a sin, too strong of a spirit. It can't just innocently happen that somebody's in rebellion. Rebellion is a choice. Rebellion is something we decide right. to do. It's a willful <clears throat> sin. So rebe rebellion is deliberate, not ignorant. Uh, rebellion induces complacency. When you feel like you're the law, then you're complacent about obedience. It, it creates excuses and it emboldens the soul to argue against the messenger of God. It, it emboldens. Rebellion emboldens the soul to argue against the messenger of God. Is that M I, as an I M or I N in Bolden? M E M. Oh, E M. E M Bolden. E M Bolden. E M Bolden. All right. Uh, now I I, I when I decided to teach this here in the college, I asked the Lord to help me uh, to bring this down because I know we're dealing with with church members. We're dealing with people in the church. We're dealing with people that aspire to ministry and we're dealing with saints of God and Sunday school teachers and, and uh, whatever road singers, whatever, you, bus drivers, whatever you may uh, uh, aspire to do in your local assembly. But I ask God to help me to, to bring this down to try to illustrate to you what can happen in a church setting. What can happen to an individual. And uh, there may perhaps be somebody in this room that may recognize who I'm, I'm talking about. But I, I, I prayed about this and, and, and I asked the Lord to help me to be able to show you an illustration of, uh, in our modern setting of what can happen to an individual. I had a young man in, in my church that uh, came to us from a backslidden condition. He had actually received the Holy Ghost in another church, in another location. But I've known him ever since he started hanging around the church. He was good friends with my uh, oldest son, who is now pastoring in Canada. And, uh, uh, but he was backslidden for a few years. But from his own testimony, the thing that he had moved to the Phoenix area, uh, where he didn't live before. But uh, he was listening to a tape. Uh, of a preacher preaching and that preacher happened to be myself and a, a message that I've used many times many different locations called the antitoxin for the serpent serum uh, it's a message about the snake bite and how that and I don't want to preach the whole message but how that you have to have the serum of the snake to produce the antitoxin that will destroy the serum and, and uh, talking about how Jesus Christ took sin into himself and by that produced the, the deliverance from sin and so he was listening to that message and God really got a hold of his heart and so it was an act of God God got a hold of him, I was the preacher preaching on the tape and he was close to our church and so he came to our church and repented and he got into the church and he could not do enough for me. He was such a blessing. That particular time we were just moving out of one uh, location into another location. This has been quite a few years ago and, uh, uh, and, and so we became a mobile church. Uh, even though we bought a new building we had trouble with the city of Scottsdale for many years and we're not able to inhabit our building. And So we were renting this place and this place community Community centers, uh, the the, the, the uh, little four square church, a Baptist church, a school buildings, libraries. We just all over the place in Scottsdale, and this this young man, uh, uh, I, I was good to him also, and and reciprocated the the blessings that he was blessing me with because he was he was just helping, he was ushering, he was uh, helping to clean the church and and, and all of that. So he, it ended up I I let him live in a motor home that I had. 
uh, for quite a period of time and uh, uh, rent free, uh, just let him live in that. And then uh, when we got uh, into our new building, uh, I, I set him up in a, a room of the church there. That was like a little apartment, and uh, he lived there for quite a time. And uh, it's uh, charging just a little penance of, of rent there, enough to cover utilities was all. And so, so he was there, and, and he was such a blessing. We were in these different locations, and he would carry the PA equipment, drove a pickup truck, so he would haul stuff, you know, and, and, and be there and set things up, you know, along with the help of other people. But he was the main one carrying that, the main one doing the ushering and all of that. But he started liking a girl in the church, and that girl um, didn't like him. And he just kept pressing, kept pressing, until finally I had to say something to him. I, I, I said, you know, she, she does not want your attention. She does not want you pressing her. You need to back off. And uh, he went away from that meeting with myself. And this is after him being in the church for years, being a great blessing. And also I'm training him for the ministry, Bible studies, Bible studies, hours and hours and hours in the Word of God. And, and, and already starting to preach, to getting up in, in my pulpit, using him more than any other young person, you know, starting to preach. And, and But now I've got to back him off a little bit, you know. Well, he went away and told, he said, yeah, Brother Abbott doesn't know what he's talking about. He said, wait till I turn on my charm, you know, I'll win her. And uh, so... Finally, this girl came to me again. She said, he's still at it. And, he, you know, he's, he's, just, he's just pressing me, trying to get close, trying to put his arm around me, this kind of stuff. And I want to be his friend, but I don't want to go with him. You know, so I finally had to call this man in, and, and this, this young man. And I said, look, back off and leave her alone. Well, when I, when I, when I had to take authority over him, his spirit totally changed. Now, he's still living in our church. He's still right there where all the stuff is, but he quit helping at all. We had to send somebody else to go pick up the equipment from the place where he's living to bring it. Somebody else had to drive a long distance and get the stuff and take it there. Uh, his, his attitude totally changed. He was always sitting on the front row, greeting people that come in, giving them songbooks, ushering and, and, and helping with that. He moved to the back row. His, his, his attitude changed. And, and, and over a period of time, he began this little... Uh, this little talk thing, talking against this one and against this one and, and all of that. And then then he met a young lady and, and uh, everything seemed to really click and, and uh, we were all excited and I, I drove about 2,000 miles to go help perform the ceremony and we were excited, hoping this would be his cure. But friend, that won't cure rebellion. And it's 9 o'clock right now, but give me just a moment. That won't cure rebellion. And, and, and but but we were all excited and hoping for the best. And he got married, and and uh, I believe as a married couple they were in our church for about ten more months. And that degenerated to the place where his wife became more vicious even than he, picking up on that spirit. Wow. And I sat down in the office with them and listened to words I've never heard any other saint ever say to me before, uh, talking that they could not trust me and uh, that I uh, I was seeking nothing but their hurt. The young lady said to me that I have never spoken one uh, word to her that wasn't wasn't uh, damaging or evil, and I, and I, I, I thought, where did she get that? At? I, I've never had a conflict, never had a crossword with her. Always went out of my way to be nice to her. But this this spirit blinds people. Right. The last time that I talked to this young man, I, I said, we need to talk again. Let's go to the office, and 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 he said. Uh, he used some Bible illustration. He's very knowledgeable of the Bible. He said, going to the office with, with you would be like Joab going in the, in the office with, uh, with Abner, you know, or Abner going in the office with Joab. In other words, I'm going to put a sword in it. He said that, or he said that? No, he said he that said to me, it. yes. He, he said it better than I just said it. <laughs> I'm sure he did. Uh, and so... You know, I was trying to reason with them, trying to, to get them to, to settle settle in. But no, no, there was, there was just no settling in. And I told him, I said, you know where all this all started, don't you? And one time I, he called me on the phone and, and, and I, I, I said, brother, you know where this all started, don't you? It started when I called you on that, that girl. That's where your spirit changed. I didn't know his wife was listening on the other end of the line. 
And she said, that's the fourth time I've heard you say that girl's name. She said, if you say it one more time, I'm going to sue you. This is saints. In church, you know. I'm going to sue you. Of course, uh, that'd be pretty tough. <laughs> that's been a year ago. They're in their fourth church now. And they've hurt everywhere they went. They're doing damage everywhere they go. Until that spirit is cleared out, friend. Jesus. You, you cannot allow yourself to become insubordinate. Which means that you will not be under authority. I must be under authority. Amen. I, I, I have a fellowship of men that are strong enough that they will call me down if I'm wrong. They'll call me on the phone if I'm wrong. And I have a mentor, a special mentor, and that's Brother Donald Eichert, who is like a pastor to me. And I've asked him to be that in my life. And, and, and I, I, I want to be under that authority. And you must be under authority, and you cannot get that spirit of rebellion in your heart. It is a destructive, destructive spirit. Everybody has to submit. The Bible even says for us to submit ourselves one to another. The Bible says, wives, submit yourself to your husbands. Amen. And it doesn't say, husbands, submit yourself to your wife. But it does say we all must be in submission. Amen. And so, uh, God help us. Let's stand and pray about it. Okay?